But in Australia, uh, Simon worked hard understanding and then being involved with the AEMO, the Australian Electricity Market Operators, ISP. The Australian ISP, Integrated System Plan, is the leading modeling effort in the world in terms of sophistication, cost, documentation, and probably also importance to its nation's uh, grid future. That's Mark Nelson, a nuclear engineer and nuclear advocate, talking about the ISP. And the Simon he just mentioned is the Simon Holmes Accord we introduced last episode. The extremely intelligent, extremely wealthy, and very influential advocate of renewable energy in Australia. Now, Mark's a sharp guy, and he realizes that the cost of a renewable energy system rises sharply at about the point when you start to have to move a lot of energy around. When the amount of wind on a grid, say, is higher than the capacity factor of wind on that grid, costs mount. But yet, he still has very high regard for Simon and also a high regard for the ISP. It's in the nuclear industry, but he's, he's very interesting and he's got a lot of perspectives that I find I, I just cannot, I don't want to operate without talking to Simon. Which he thinks now shows the renewable energy can be pretty cheap. ISP seems to indicate at the moment that you can get to 99% decarbonized with sun, wind, water, batteries, and some other storage technologies still to come at a reasonable wholesale electricity price. In the last episode, we heard about how CSIRO's gen cost report essentially deceived a nation into thinking that we could have quite a cheap renewable energy system, up to 90% renewables. And they did this by claiming up front that the costs they had included all the transmission, all the storage and integration firming costs to make renewable energy reliable. But actually, that wasn't true. In the fine print, it turns out they only included a fraction of the costs. Make sure you go back and watch that episode. And when I wrote a Twitter thread about that, there was this incredible hard pivot towards the ISP. The chief energy economist of the CSIRO, Paul Graham himself, he wrote and confirmed those costs were missed, but said it was the ISP's job to add them all up. Simon Holmes Accord, of course, he pivoted the weight of his argument pretty hard to the ISP too. And that's where this story picks up. Another missing cost story in another big, long, official looking document. Sure, the main report's about 100 pages, but there's about six appendices as well that are roughly 100 pages each, a massive methodology document, an inputs assumptions document, heaps of workbooks showing weather traces, all these generation outlooks. It is just a veritable jungle in which costs can be hidden and concealed. Sounds like fun? So when AEMO themselves released a press release claiming that their ISP did model the full system costs, the whole system costs, Simon was positively crowing on Twitter, pointing out how I should have just consulted with the experts and checked first. And he kept mocking and crowing right up to the point when I had, and even after I had, opened up this big 59 megabyte data pack that he said probably no one could interpret without experts helping them. And when I did, of course, have a look in that data pack, I found it absolutely easy to see where that added up the total system costs. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked to see what a tiny shard of the full system they actually had costed. I always knew they hadn't really costed the full thing, but I was just gobsmacked at how little was actually there. And that means that even the gen cost report, a whole bunch of things that it was relying on the ISP to show were missing from that too. So the depth of the deception and the amount of costs that were missed are just now on a whole other level. But what really gets me is the response to this. At the time of recording, we now have our energy minister quoting the AEMO press release, the very title of which is a direct lie. And he's quoting in pretty much every major newspaper he can find and on social media. Firstly, the CSIRO, our scientific agency, and AEMO that runs our energy grid have done the work. In order to quash the criticism that has been received, we have a government minister quoting a lie from a statutory government authority that he's a major stakeholder in to quash criticism. Now, while Simon can't quite bring himself to admit that his mates at AEMO have done anything wrong, turns out he probably knew all along that not all the costs were included. And in fact, he said he'd quite like it if they were. Welcome to another extremely important, but not at all military episode of Miltech and Tech. So how do we figure out how everyone got the wrong idea about the ISP in the first place? Well, we can start by just reading through like an innocent observer and just see what they say. And the impression you get is about how incredibly holistic and comprehensive it is. They mention the words whole of system a bunch of times, straight up front. And skimming through, it looks like they thought of everything. There's loads of renewables, 
whole lot of storage, and a nice big map showing where it's all gonna be linked up by transmission. And it looks like they've thought of all the nitty gritty technical details like system strength, frequency management. There's also a bunch of public policies such as carbon constraints model two, scenarios tracking all the uncertainty about economic conditions and consumer habits. And it looks like this is done within a beautiful framework that sets out a lovely consultation process so everything is nice and transparent. It just looks and feels world-class. So Australia has spent, uh, I think, tens of thousands of man hours millions of dollars, no, more than tens of thousands, I'll check the numbers, tens of millions of dollars are going into this ISP plan. But you just wanna be impressed, like Mark. So by the time you're about halfway through the document, you just pass these fantastic summary paragraphs. They tell you how much we need of the key things, like about five times rooftop solar, nine times utility scale wind and solar, and we also need a fantastic array of different storage, which is more like 10 times what we currently have. It looks like they basically have everything covered. And about this point, I start to look for that nice summary paragraph of just how much transmission. And then I realize it's just not there. Did they just forget it? No, actually it's more like the opposite. In fact, pretty much the rest of the entire document is all about transmission. This major section called the optimal development path. Well, transmission is all they're talking about in all of it. This is the first hint that you really get to start, stop reading the ISP like just a dumb fan and start to really get the nuance about what it's like. All the pieces of the puzzle are there, but not all of them are handled in the same way. Transmission is handled very, very differently. To understand why transmission is different from the rest, we have to zoom out a little bit. You see, the national energy market, the NEM, didn't always exist. It used to be the case that the states managed all their electricity pretty independently. Then in 1998, they connected up and the NEM was born. And in 2017, a major report by the chief scientist, um, Dr. Alan Finkel, was completed. And he recommended fairly sensibly that we start to think about how we plan transmission, not on a state by state basis, but more for a whole East Coast grid. And he recommended that things like, you know, how to create renewable energy zones be considered from that more holistic integrated perspective. And I guess that's really the rub. AEMO wasn't commissioned to be the whole grand designer, the full master of the entire system. They were commissioned to find out the best possible transmission plan, given that we were going to build a new renewable energy system anyway. Now the optimal development path kind of makes sense. It really should have been called the optimal transmission development path. And you can see how they got to it by looking at the 600 page appendix called cost benefit analysis and the sort of experiment they do to arrive at it. Basically they test swapping in and out different transmission projects and moving back different transmission projects to see which one has the best effect on the overall system. How do you get the right transmission sequence build to make the whole system work best? Now the answer to that question is of absolutely profound importance because now you get to understand how the ISP relates to the rest of the whole of the system. They need to model the rest of the system so they can figure out which transmission plan is actually best. Zooming out a little bit, as we discussed in the last video, once you proceed beyond something like 35 or 40% renewables energy in your system, you have to do at least one of three things to continue decarbonizing. One is that you move energy through space using transmission to a different place that doesn't ha have enough yet. Two, you can move energy through time using storage to a different time when they need more energy. Or three, you continue building more solar and wind without either of the other two and the result is you still keep getting more energy at the times you need, but you waste energy as well at the times you have too much. This is called spillage or curtailment. Some combination of these things is gonna be good. And what the ISP is trying to figure out effectively is what combination of these things and in which order do you stage them to get the best overall build for consumers. To simplify things just a little bit, the most important question to answer is whether we front load with one aspect of the system. First possibility is we front load with transmission. That's one choice. Or the other alternative is we could front load with extra storage, particularly batteries at the same place as the solar wind farms. That way we could get by and continue, continue decarbonizing with a little bit less transmission. Basically the solar and wind would be a bit less effective and a bit more costly. The final choice is that we just keep building more solar and wind without either of those two in which case we'd get a little more spillage or curtailment and the efficiency and return to investors from those existing solar and wind farms wouldn't be quite as good. Now it's worthwhile highlighting that there is an enormous moral hazard here. You see the battery storage and the generators, they're generally paid for by, well, the companies, the private companies building them. And if they have to raise extra money, that at least gets costed and they have to ask people to pay a higher price basically to arrange their finance. 
That process is all relatively competitive and transparent. And crucially, the money that's on the line is that of businesses and investors. Transmission is completely different. Basically, the regulator does this very fancy, sophisticated test called an RITT in this case, to check whether building more transmission in a particular place would be overall economically good for the whole system and especially consumers. And once that test is passed, they basically rule that all consumers will have to pay whoever builds that system the right price to cover all their costs, capital and operating, for as long as that piece in is in place. So basically the cost there is borne necessarily inevitably by consumers. That's a massive distinction. Private money almost always pays for the generators and the storage, but it's the consumers that foot the bill for transmission. Now that tension, it comes into sharp focus when we're planning our energy transition. Basically, if we front load with transmission, that necessarily reduces the amount of curtailment or the demand for extra storage for all the solar and wind farms. That means that they can basically offer the electricity at a cheaper price to buyers. That really helps their business case and basically improves their return. So it's definitely in the interests of the solar and wind investors that they maximize and front load transmission. Now, Aemo recognizes this tension and this moral hazard. And because of it, they put in place this special commission, this special panel of experts called the Consumer Panel to produce critical reviews of the ISP at certain points in order to protect the interests of consumers. We'll be hearing more from them later. So with that said, how does AEMO model the whole energy system in order to figure out the best transmission build? Let's use another silly analogy. Imagine the job is to make sausages, but you're not the butcher that has complete control of the whole sausage making process. In fact, this is gonna be done by a sort of team effort kind of committee process. What we need is someone who's gonna kind of corral and control and make sort of suggestions about how the committee should proceed. And we pick in this case, the person whose job and expertise it is, is to tie up the sausage skin. Now the sausage skin is kind of important because the person that ties all that up, they kind of have to see and touch everything that goes into it. And everything is contained by that. It's the thing that makes it all hold together and not fall apart. That's kind of like what transmission is to our energy system. It connects it all together and has to make sure it doesn't fall apart. And that's why AEMO is chosen for this process. But this team effort for sausage making is kind of sloppy actually in a few other ways. In fact, there's no effort to make the best sausage from scratch because there's a few other scraps from the street that just get thrown into the start. It's more of a Tenardier's kitchen kind of sausage making process. Kidney off a horse, liver off a cat, filling up the sausages with this and that. Present. That's right. There are actually big parts of our energy system that aren't necessarily optimized in any way. They're just thrown into the mix by basically different layers of government over the last few decades, catching up on all the things that were perceived at the time to be politically expedient. Take Snowy Hydro 2.0. This is a massive pumped hydro project. And at the time it was announced, years ago, I knew plenty of people that were extremely skeptical of the engineering and economics when it was priced at about $2 billion. It's now at $12 billion. I'm not sure whether many people, even Simon, are arguing this is the best way and time to spend that money. That's your liver of a horse thrown into the mix right there. Now, of course, the federal government is not the only one guilty of making things that are more politically expedient than engineeringly efficient part of our energy system. State governments have been sponsoring and subsidizing rooftop solar for years, decades in fact. Now, I know everyone absolutely loves rooftop solar. We feel like we're doing our little bit and we have price structures, story for another day, but price structures that make us feel like we're doing our bit too and that it's very effective and efficient. But truth is, from a whole system perspective, installing gigawatts of solar power in millions of tiny installations over everyone's home actually makes things much, much more difficult and expensive. That's your kidney of a cat, rooftop solar. Solar. So these two things, major things, are just thrown into the mix. There's no effort at all by AEMO to try to measure or optimize them in any particular way. If they were trying to optimize them, you'd see AEMO doing scenario testing where maybe Snowy 2 was dialed up to 3 gigawatts instead of 2, or maybe it was just brought down to 1 or removed entirely. They do no such thing. No such critique is done anymore. Or they might make suggestions for solar for state governments. Perhaps we need extra subsidies in Queensland where they still burn coal and have lots of sun. And maybe a little bit less subsidies in Tasmania where they have perfect hydropower and the sun's pretty terrible all winter. But no, they make absolutely no suggestions or efforts at all to optimize on any of those things. So now we've established that definitely it's not the entire system that is optimized. But isn't there some more optimization going on somewhere that's not just transmission? Well, yes, there is. AEMO, as the person in charge of tying up the sausage skin, 
actually has to make some suggestions and do some analysis of what all the stuff is that fits in the gaps. That's where there is some more optimization. So at the risk of stretching the analogy just a little bit too far, the process we've got to so far looks kind of like this. First, the group making sausages is given some kind of appetite, the total demand, and they have overlaid with that some sort of dietary requirements, like low carbon in this case. Thrown into the mix is the liver of the horse, kidney of the cat, like Snowy 2.0 and all the rooftop solar, and a few coal-fired power station retirements. And then after that, they have to do this experiment of trying to figure out where they tie the best knots in the sausage skin, i.e. which transmission projects to build and when. Now, in order to figure out how we do this the best, they try to sequence those potential transmission projects and then figure out what is the cheapest recipe that involves the least expensive actual real meat to fill in the gaps and also gel with the liver of the horse, kidney of the cat, like Snowy Hydro 2 and all the rooftop solar. Now I can hear Simon Holmes at court writhing in frustration at the way I've described this because I think he thinks it is actually an optimization of the whole system, which it's not. It's only an optimi optimization of what's left after we count for all the bits that have been pr thrown in by previous government policies. And, and this is where it gets interesting, they also need to take account for potential future government policies. And not just future government policies, but future economic trends and consumer patterns. Now, the obvious big features here are things like what will the government do with carbon reductions and a binding carbon budget? Or what will happen with things like electrification of vehicles and economic growth, population growth? Now, AEMO has to account for a range of different uncertainties here, and they do this by using some scenarios that take a mix of these different things. The idea is that they use a few of these scenarios to make sure that the one plan they have doesn't turn out to be a terrible one if things don't turn out exactly as expected. So how do they do this? Well, they model these different scenarios in this tremendous big book called the IASR and a whole bunch of Excel files and workbooks besides. And in these, they put the main features and an awful lot of details about things like, let's call it the appetite, the total demand, and also things like the dietary requirement, assumptions about carbon budgets in future government policies. And it's also in this book where they throw in things like liver of the horse, kidney of the cat, and say what they assume about rooftop solar and snowy hydro. And then for each and every scenario with its liver of the horse, kidney of the cat, the appetite, the dietary requirements, you take each and every different idea about how you think you'll tie up the knots in the sausage skin or the transmission sequence, and you test all of those for how good they are by cranking a handle on a fancy machine which spits out the recipe from what the best other things are to fill in all the gaps. And then you add up how much that, this, that whole system costs and you determine which ones the best ones are. And you do this process for every combination of all the scenarios and bind them into a massive big set of workbooks in a big zip file that's 59 megabytes long called Generation Outlook. Now for each scenario, you'll have figured out the best sequence of transmission builds that gives you the lowest cost sausage based on all the things that are required to fill in the gaps. However, there's a bit of uncertainty about which scenario is gonna play out. You need some kind of way of weighting which scenario you think is the most important. So you try to optimize for that a bit more whilst allowing for the fact there's still a chance that you might go to the other scenarios. So to get those weightings, they call together another panel of experts and get them to go through a special kind of voting process where they also get to talk about some of their reasons while still keeping it sort of anonymous. It's called a Delphi process. And those weightings they use to kind of weigh up which transmission builds are best overall, hopefully mostly good for the best one, but not too bad for the runners up as well. And then they announce what they are in a, what they all are in a big report called the Integrated System Plan, the ISP. And guess what? The ISP finds that the most important scenario is one called step change. And to meet it, balancing for the other weighted scenarios that come runner up, the most important overall thing we can do is really heavily front load our transmission. In fact, we need to rush through as actionable projects this whole clutch of huge transmission trunk lines that are designed to connect our population centers to pumped hydro schemes in Tasmania, but most of all, also Snowy Hydro 2. Now, this is definitely the best possible outcome for existing solar and wind investments because front loading all that transmission minimizes curtailment. And not just that, it also connects them to this giant centrally planned taxpayer funded storage system, which will be able to buy extra electricity off them when there's too much already in the system. That's another customer. So this is fantastic for them. They win all round, less wastage, new customers. It's absolutely the best for maximizing their returns. Now the scenario weighted chart of net benefits to the market, i.e. consumers, looks like this. And these numbers look huge. 
This is billions, tens of billions of dollars of benefits delivered to consumers. So it looks like we've found a winner and a clear one too. Thanks Aemo for finding the perfect plan for us. Let's rush on and get all these things built and start delivering these huge benefits. Now, if that's the view you've held to date and you want to continue on as one of the lemmings who thinks that the ISP and Aemo are brilliant, tune out now. Remember when we explained before that to continue decarbonizing beyond a certain point, we either had to waste some energy or start moving it either through space or time using transmission or storage. And we had to be super careful about protecting consumers in that because whilst the transmission was paid entirely by consumers, when we invest in storage and new generators that might have extra wastage, at least those costs have to be exposed to normal commercial pressures and they have to add up how much the electricity is gonna cost in advance to try to sell their electricity through Ford contracts. Now this chart here shows you exactly how that moral hazard plays out in practice. The top side shows you what happens when we do build all that transmission. The bottom side shows you what we have more of when we use the counterfactual, which builds none of that extra transmission. Now you know that people think that building more transmission allows us to build more renewables, right? Well, actually it's kind of the opposite in this case. Without transmission, we actually build more renewables and we continue to decarbonize. How do we do this? Basically we have to accept increasing curtailment that is wastage, and also have to build more extra storage, probably co-located with the, with the renewable generators. And we can still meet our targets that way. And instead, what happens in the proposed case with all the extra transmission is we actually build less renewables than that case. We actually keep more coal-fired power stations in place and running, and in the very short term, burn more coal. Now, why on earth would renewables investors want that? Well, it's pretty obvious when you look at the commercial interests because if they had to build extra storage or accept that more of energy, their energy was gonna be wasted, they would have to ask for a higher price for the energy they could sell in order to cover all those costs. And that would be problematic for their business plan and also problematic for the narrative that renewables are also, are always cheaper. Now, whilst it's definitely in renewables investors' interest to want all that transmission built sooner, that's not necessarily wrong if that aligns with the interests of consumers. I.e., if the extra bit that was added to our bill to pay for more transmission was less than the extra bit that the generators would have to charge to pay for all their extra storage, things might still be okay. And that's what this net benefits number is all about. And that number looks like it's pretty high and positive, like 20 billion or so. That should be a pretty strong bet in favor of this being good for consumers too. However, the devil is in the detail. That particular counterfactual is not the only alternative. That's where we build none of the transmission ever at any stage. There's another potential development path where we just don't rush anything right now. And all these mega projects just get put on hold for a year or two while we wait and see whether the costs go up or down or how the system evolves. This is just like one step less front loading of the transmission, but it would have a huge impact on how much we try to rush into construction right now. The development path that tests this is called development path number nine. And instead of a difference of like $24 billion in net benefits, the difference is more like $0.4 billion of net benefits. That is like a massive change in terms of the consequences. To put that into perspective, $0.4 billion on what AEMO says the total system costs is like 0.3%. And if that included all the system costs, it'd be way less than that. Now in Australia, last quarter, Australians got like a 25 to 30% increase in their power bills. So 0. Point something small percent is like, it's like a rounding error. There's nothing in it at all. And so this decision, the most important decision that the ISP really does, which projects should we rush right now versus leave for another couple of years for the next ISP? That decision actually hinges on a total knife edge. There's no urgency about that at all. The difference between doing all of them in a hurry and none of them in a hurry is like paper, paper thin. Even our federal budget cites Aemo's urgency here and says that it has to be advanced really quickly. Now, actually, this isn't new news. This has been raised before by the consumer panel in their report like over a year ago. They point out that it's not really clear even that some of these projects need to be advanced at all. So please don't just trust me on this. Other experts have been raising these concerns before. Now, why would Aemo want to do this, rush these projects soon through as soon as possible? Now, forgive me for being a little bit cynical, but I can think of at least one really good reason. If things got pushed back by another few years, then a bunch of these projects would probably finish well after 2030, 
And that's the cutoff where currently the CSIRO's gen cost reports considers all the previous spending to be sunk. So if we let them slip a little bit, suddenly Australians might, through CSIRO's gen cost, get a clearer picture of how much this renewables transition will actually cost. Now, while considering how much this whole decision just teetered on a knife edge in terms of which way to go, I decided to go and have a look at the data to see whether the extra front loading of transmission really did offset that much generator capital to make it more worthwhile. And I was kind of shocked by what I found. Yes, it's true, the transmission hump, it did exist. It was pretty clear, but the rest of it, it just seemed to jump around all over the place. Look at this, like this fuel line, with the extra transmission, we burn more for a couple of years, then much less for a few years, then more again for a while, then much the same for a bit, then suddenly more again at the end. Now, as a data scientist, I look at this and I know exactly what that means. It means the whole modeling effort has been hopelessly overfit. It means the capacity they've modeled is so tightly hugging the demand curve that it bounces around in response to the odd fluctuations of individual weather years. Now, in reality, you can't do that. You don't know exactly which year is gonna come next. So you can't do things like reduce the amount of batteries and generators that you have in the system just because you didn't need quite as many that year. And that's what this report does. Now, in the real world, we don't get to know exactly which year and what weather is coming next. We have to be ready for any year, every year. And so this gets a hard fail from me on pure technical competence alone. If you were doing any kind of basic data science course, you'd be taught how to recognize this kind of problem when your model is overfitting and when it's significant to the outcome in the first few weeks of your study. And a few months later, you'd be taught how to fix it, which isn't really that hard with a process called regularization. But it looks in this case like IEMO has done neither of those things. They haven't recognized the problem or tried to fix it. Despite the fact that in consultations, people have raised it as a potential problem and suggest they do something about it. It's just been ignored. This changes quite a bit how I view the integrity of the ISP. Before we were sitting on this kind of razor thin knife edge decision between advancing everything in a rush and nothing in a rush. And back then it looked so close that it could be fudgeable. But now it just looks farcical because the randomness of weather patterns in your individual sequence of years could probably knock projects in or out of being in a rush or not. Again, I'm not the first person to raise this as a problem. Please read the reports of the consumer panel and all the consultation processes. Still not sure if that knife edge teetering means it's a real problem. What if there was one of the critical parts of the system that was not costed accurately? Say the most critical part, transmission. Now this is something that I've been circling around with suspicion for quite a while because in the ISP, it looks like in about mid 2030s, we only need an extra billion dollars of annual costs to cover the costs of all the transmission that we would have built in that time. But here's a single transmission operator proposing to spend like $12 billion or so just for one state, where the ISP says that's like about the amount that we would need to build for the whole of the NEM. Something doesn't add up here. It seems kind of weird to me. Thankfully, someone way more expert than me has written about this. Simon Bartlett in a submission about this year's inputs and assumptions has noted that something's odd. And it's not a small discrepancy, not a few percent. He thinks it's more like a factor of three billions and billions of dollars, enough to completely collapse the conclusion we should be rushing any of these projects. And there's loads more crazy stuff in Simon's report, like huge things like your whole model is optimizing for the wrong thing and biases in this kind of way. This is insane. Please read the other experts. It's not just me. Now let's just zoom out a sec. We've been looking at this question about how to sequence transmission, which really I think is the main and proper purpose of the ISP. Now, if you'd asked me up until a few days ago, maybe a week or so ago, I would have said that maybe the ISP was quite good and proper and competent and correct on answering this particular question. And the real problem was that other people were arguing that it answered a different question, a question about what's the best technology path for our energy transition in the first place. I would have said it's not fit to direct and inform questions about what technology choice we should make for our full energy pathway because it's actually meant to reflect and conform to the government choices they've already made about that. What it's meant to do is direct and inform the choice about how we sequence our transmission. But every time I've scratched the surface and gone a little bit deeper, particularly when I've encountered other experts that have written and know way more than me, I have been absolutely shocked and appalled that I don't think the ISP has got any of that right either. Now, there's still a possibility, I suppose, that all of this is just innocent mistakes, that 
it's all just a coincidence that it landed this way. And really, AEMO just deserves a pat on the back and maybe some extra training and mentoring while we're paying for extra high power prices. But this is all perfectly innocent and we can fix it all together. Now, to address this question of whether this is just potential accidental stuff ups or some kind of deliberate manipulation, I think we need to turn to this question of whether the ISP actually does show that renewables are cheaper than coal and gas and by extrapolation nuclear. Now to be clear, I never thought this was the real purpose of the ISP. But since we have Simon Holmes Accord, the Federal Minister for Energy, and we have other state ministers for energy, and now AEMO themselves claiming that it shows this, I think we should take a few minutes to assess them on those grounds. Now, if you're one of the decent and competent people inside the tent at AEMO or elsewhere, and you knew it was never meant to prove this point, then damn it, you should have spoken up sooner, but it's still not too late, and this is not personally directed at you. But if we assess the ISP as though it is intended and fit to answer that question, are renewables cheaper than coal and gas? It looks incredibly deliberately manipulated. Through that, let's go back to our sausage and try to figure out what that fancy optimizer stuffed inside around the liver of the horse, kidney of the cat, and the biggest, best version of the transmission build out. Well, there's loads of uh, wind and solar, of course, and that huge front loader transmission build out. It looks like this tiny little wedge here, which might be a factor of two or three too small. But where's the storage? So all the storage, it's in these wedges here. There's a tiny slither of pumped hydro, which actually, it turns out is a lot of depth. Uh, and then there's a little bit of this medium storage, this grid scale stuff. And then there's this huge, massive wedge of DER. It's like 40 something gigawatts, more than double the entire coal fleet in terms of capacity that we currently have right now. It's absolutely the lion's share of storage. Now, apparently there was a model where they did a sensitivity test to see what it'd be like if we had less of this stuff, only like 35 gigawatts still nearly double the current coal fleet we have today. This is absolutely the most important filler uh, in the storage part of this sausage. So what is it? What is DER? Well, it's basically behind the meter storage, which means it's things like power walls that make up virtual power plants, power walls that people have and buy for their own homes. It also means electric cars that can be plugged into the wall and might potentially send energy back to the grid in a way that can be coordinated or controlled for ideal times. Now, as it turns out in the most likely scenario, step change, DER is modeled as being enormous. In fact, electric vehicle uptake is assumed at 99% by 2050. That sounds like absolutely transformational change, and it is. Now, not only does it add a whole lot of extra demand to the system, but also there's these modeled assumptions that there is huge behavioral shifts where people stop charging, plugging in their cars to charge them at a time that's most convenient to them and start charging them and discharging mostly at a time that's convenient for the grid. Now, to be fair to AEMO, they're pretty transparent about what a massive transformational change this is. And they sketch out that it would be a huge change for the distributors, require a lot of new market structures and incentives, additional technology. It's, it's going to be big. They're open to that. And they approach the whole thing with this kind of really chipper, enthusiastic, Bob the Builder kind of attitude. Can we fix this? Yeah, sure we can. But how are they actually going with that? How are they going with fixing it? Well, it turns out they're um, they're calling for a working group. Yep, they actually said that. They're calling for a working group. And as it turns out, loads and loads of people have pointed out how extremely optimistic these projections really are. But there's one thing that you might not have realized yet about this DER, which changes everything. The whole thing is not modeled as having any cost at all. That's right. All these systems, which are modeled with all the assumptions in fairly incredible detail, how much people will shift their behaviors, how many electrons at what time of day we can get what discharge. It's modeled in the system. It's just not modeled as a cost. It's modeled essentially as being free. And this is where the whole validity of the ISP and whether it costs everything or not and what it proves just comes crashing down in a heap. As I've explained earlier, the ISP takes these things that are produced by political convenience, scraps off the street, like Snowy Hydro 2, like all that rooftop solar, and they make no effort to optimize them. They also don't include them as a cost. They're modeled to exist, but they're not costed at all. But as it turns out, Snowy 2 and all the rooftop solar, liver of a horse, kidney of a cat, kind of inconvenient things, they're not the only things that were thrown into the mix by free. We also threw in this most magical, brilliant type of gap filler that slots into every nook and cranny in the grid and just magically nets off demand at the right times from people's homes. And it has this perfect compliance with our dietary requirements because they assume there is zero carbon output associated with it. This is like caviar 
as a gap filler in the sausage we're building. And it's caviar that you are paying for. The consumers have to pay for this entire great big wedge that the energy system will depend upon. And not only will consumers have to buy the power walls and the electric cars and change their behavior about when they drive them to suit the grid, but all the upgrades to the distribution infrastructure that lets the power get to the cars and out of the power walls, that has to be upgraded too. And there is no cost for that either. We already have distributors proposing increasing their charges on people's power bills in the next few years for exactly these changes to meet the AEMO's ISP's demands for distributed energy resources. And the AEMO's ISP doesn't incorporate this as a cost at all. And this is why the idea that the ISP costs and optimizes the whole system is so blatantly and utterly completely wrong. They don't cost anything they don't optimize. And they don't optimize almost all the storage all of Snowy Hydro 2 and all of the battery storage, almost all of it at least, this distributed energy resources is not optimized and not costed. So that means that the gen cost report, which is referring to the ISP for these future battery projections, they didn't cost the lion's share of the storage either. And you can see why this is just such a wet dream for the energy investors that are investing in wind and solar. At the very start, Taxpayers pay for Snowy Hydro. The consumers pay for the transmission to connect to Snowy Hydro. And then we assume the consumers keep paying for all the extra battery storage that's required to balance out the grid. And only at the very last stage do they come roaring home to really seize all the glory with a big build out of wind and solar. And so this, this is just frankly outrageous. Imagine if the CEO of a major company came and announced they had this plan to the board and it was the best plan because it was the cheapest and it was the cheapest because they used heaps of this stuff called DER. But then when you dug into their models, you found actually that all that DER was just paid for by somebody else. It was an exogenous input, as Simon likes to put it. And that was why it looked the cheapest. Surely the CEO would be fired and they'd rerun the models properly. Now I could take these models seriously if there was some serious effort to model some of the costs required to drive this behavior change. If there was some kind of subsidy required to get us to 99% electric vehicle uptake and that subsidy was costed, well, that could be taken more seriously. Or imagine if we, in order for people to charge mostly at a time that suited the grid, we had to have way more fast charges in place, probably on the street, probably in people's garages, and the distribution costs, the upgrade for that was taken into account, then I could start to take this seriously. But absolutely none of that has been taken into account. There is no system cost associated with any of it. And it's these kinds of costs that would probably run to hundreds of billions. But because they're not within AEMO's jurisdictional boundary, they're just happy to model them as free. And I think that is ridiculous. So how can get, they get away with this? Well, they get away with this because of this incredibly naive, ridiculously optimistic, everybody wins kind of view of economics. The distributors, the grid, the consumers, everybody's got benefits here. Nobody has any kind of cost. Also distribution companies are actually proposing raising their prices right now. And yet AEMO has modeled those costs as being constant all the way through. So if you're someone who has or wants to have solar panels, electric cars, power walls, etc., you should be absolutely furious with AEMO because they have not modeled a single dollar any kind of incentive, any discount, any reward payment for you investing in and operating the assets that will support the grid in the future. Not a dollar for you. And then after receiving heaps of complaints in the consultations about how extremely optimistic this is, AMO just waves it all away with this incredible piece of hand wavy kind of arrogant nonsense. They essentially basically say, because this fits within the structure of all our other assumptions, it can't be worse than the way we've handled all of them too. But in reality, that's exactly the problem. This whole structure of the inputs and assumptions scenarios is completely open to being fudged and wrought. They just try to test for so many things that one assumption can be completely in the fine print and the detail overruled by some other countervailing assumption. I bet when people on the Delphi panel were voting for step change, which had this huge uptake of electric cars, I bet they thought they were voting for ambition and that we had to be prepared for the scale of that change. When in fact, on the other hand, step change had also modeled such an incredibly generous change in consumer behavior to pretty much gift back to the grid so much free energy storage 
They weren't voting for ambition at all. They were voting for a free handout from the consumers. These, together with the overfitting, I think explains why the ISP is such an incredible outlier in terms of how little extra infrastructure it actually says we require. Compare it to another model, such as this one that done by Net Zero Australia, this other model suggests that we need enough gas power to back up pretty much our full peak demand. And we need enough, like more than enough batteries to match that again on top of that to have a reliable energy system. Whereas the ISP, it says that you can have a tiny slither in gas and a decent slither of batteries, both of which together barely add up to our full grid demand. And that's meant to be okay. The ISP is actually the outlier here. It's crazy they've got such a, a small assumption about what the extra system costs will be. But what's definitely abundantly clear is the ISP does not cost the whole system. And these claims that it does are just blatant lies. Everybody knows this, Simon knows this, but yet still somehow this narrative persists that it does cost the whole system. And the crucial thing is, is there's just no way that you can argue that this demonstrates that one system is cheaper than another if the system that it costs as a comparison just doesn't include all the costs. But there is just one other angle that Simon Holmes Accord in particular uses to argue that the ISP does demonstrate that coal and gas are more expensive now than renewables. He thinks that because late in the scenario called slow change, where there's not a binding carbon target, the optimizer fills those areas in too with renewables and doesn't choose more gas and coal. And he thinks because of that, it demonstrates that renewables are cheaper. Now, actually all scenarios, including slow change, do have binding carbon targets for the first few years. Up to 2030, the state governments actually impose extremely aggressive targets. And I had initially thought that given all the things required by those state government targets and the new transmission and storage required to meet them, including Snowy 2, that this had so rigged the deck in favor of renewables that it made sense to keep building them thereafter for the last bit of the course too. But if I was perfectly honest and trying to steal man Simon's case, this didn't look like a slam dunk. And I still would have expected the optimizer would have chosen more coal and gas than it did if that was the case. So I had to dig deeper to see whether there was any other way in which somehow coal and gas might've been biased against. And sure enough, deep in the input and assumptions, you find exactly what you'd expect. Refurbishments of any coal-fired power stations were explicitly ruled out. This is undoubtedly the cheapest, most least capital intensive way of continuing to use coal. And it was just by AEMO's arbitrary decision eliminated. Okay, so what about new build? Well, it turns out that pretty much all of Victoria's coal and certainly the cheapest coal, brown coal, is eliminated as well. Just by arbitrary decree, pretty much saying because they didn't think the government was gonna use that anymore, that we should treat it as being impossible to use. Now, don't get me wrong, from an environmental perspective, brown coal is terrible. I'm no particular fan of it. But if you think you're setting up a proper experiment to see what is cheapest, you can't just keep ruling out all the cheapest options. And brown coal, in terms of the fuel cost, it's like a third or a quarter, even of black coal. It is just super, super cheap. This is another crazy, explicit bias against the system that would probably, almost certainly be cheapest at this stage. So what about gas? Now, gas power stations are actually quite a bit cheaper to build in terms of their upfront capital cost. However, their fuel is generally considered to be a bit more expensive. How much? Well, I looked at the inputs and assumptions, and it turns out that they assume it's more like four to five times as expensive as black coal, which is two or three times as expensive as brown coal, quite expensive. And just some rough comparisons, to me, it looked like they'd taken quite a recent trend that might've been skewed by events such as the Ukraine war, etc. And when I found the report from the consultant who was referred to to justify these prices, I also found the consumer panel taking this consultant's report apart. This is absolutely savage stuff. They find a bunch of ways in which he consistently seems to assume the highest particular cases. What's worse is probably how AEMO tried to defend that consultant's report. They had a special seminar and they used that to basically conclude that all the stakeholders thought that the conclusions were pretty good. Actually, it turns out this was a black box model and almost all the participants in that cinema seminar actually didn't understand it at all. And so they presented this impression that it was totally fine and confirmed by everyone, when really that wasn't the case. Now, very specifically, the consumer panel also recommended that AEMO do a sensitivity test to test low gas prices and find out at what low price things would change significantly for the ISP. As in, not just put in a price and say it didn't make any impact, but how low would it have to go before it did have an impact? AEMO ignored that recommendation completely and still just plucked out a low gas price for their sensitivity 
just that they thought was okay. And when they did that low price of gas sensitivity testing, guess what? They only ran it on the scenarios that did have a binding carbon target right to 2050. So there was no chance that they could use gas pretty much in those scenarios anyway. It just seems so completely rigged. Still don't think the deck is rigged? Well, let's go back and look at the inputs and assumptions. As I said, sometimes these assumptions are so big and complex that you can have one assumption like not having a binding carbon target and have that completely countervailed by some other hidden assumption somewhere in the workbook. So I dug deep enough and I find, sure enough, there is a special different gas price in the different scenarios and a special coal price too. And for both the gas price and the coal price, guess which scenario had the highest version? Slow change. The only one where they didn't have a binding carbon target and gas and coal could have been used. But wait, is it the only scenario where coal and gas could have been used? What's with this steady progress scenario over here? Why haven't we heard about this yet? That question cuts to the heart of it. The answer to this question is probably most crucial in me trying to make up my mind about whether AEMO's ISP is just inept and incompetent or actually completely captured and corrupt. Now, as it turns out, steady progress was actually derived from previously a central scenario. This is one of the more likely ones. In fact, it used to be called current trajectory. Now, the other one that's derived from central because central was split is called net zero 2050, or it was. Now this pair, net zero 2050 and steady progress were meant to capsulate basically the most likely trajectories where one had a binding carbon target right at the 2050 to reach net zero and the other one didn't. Now the consumer panel agreed that splitting central into these two scenarios to test what happens with and without that binding carbon target out to 2050 was a good idea. Now AEMO notes that at some point some stakeholders said that we should throw out the one without the binding carbon target, steady progress, because that wasn't going to be likely anymore. AEMO at first resisted, saying they should definitely include the two. Now here's ground zero for the scandal. Remember that Delphi panel we mentioned, where the weightings of the different scenarios would be added up to weigh up what the net cost benefit was the different sequence of transmission builds were. We can track here what happens to these two central pairs, these two central scenarios, net zero 2050 and steady progress and see what happens. It turns out that steady progress, the one without the binding carbon target, it got basically just as many votes as another super optimistic hydrogen superpower um, scenario. Now, the one that did have the binding car carbon target called net zero 2050, it turned out to be the winner by a small margin of that Delphi panel. So those two central scenarios were pretty important. Now, if the weights of the Delphi panel with those two scenarios being pretty prominent were actually used, then at least a couple of multi-billion dollar transition projects would not have been rushed through as actionable projects. They would have been delayed and we would have assessed the costs again in the next ISP. Without informing the consumer panel, AEMO ran a second Delphi panel to throw out all those weights and even throw out one of the scenarios. Now, the excuse was that after the government formally announced a net zero target for 2050 around the time of COP26, that some of the experts would have to reassess their weightings and reconsider them. Now, that was something that was previously explicitly considered and other stakeholders holders had apparently asked about anyway, whether they'd rerun them. And initially, AMO had said no, and it was going to be okay to keep both scenarios in. And someone changed their mind, and they did exactly that anyway. And at the start of the second Delphi process, steady progress was eliminated. But why was steady progress eliminated? Well, details are pretty scant in the final ISP, but they mentioned they flagged this in the draft, so I had a look there to see what more details there were. Apparently, it was actually stakeholders who were rev reviewing the weights of the first Delphi panel that they were clamoring for the death and ejection of the steady progress scenario. And so at the start of the second Delphi panel, AEMO asked all the experts there, part of the panel, whether that's what they wanted to have happen, whether they should eliminate steady progress. And apparently the panel said yes. Now the reason for the panel's choice is given as with its failure to meet net zero ambitions. That's the reason for killing off steady progress. But why would anyone in the panel know that steady progress failed to meet net zero ambitions and not also assume that slow change which has exactly the same carbon targets would also fail to meet net zero ambitions. Why that distinction? Only someone who's run the models and knows that the slow change scenario, which has exactly the same binding targets, coincidentally reaches almost zero emissions anyway. 
probably because that one had the tweaked higher costs. And so because of this, essentially, the panel killed off a central scenario, one that was previously called current trajectory, one of the most likely, one of the most important to be tested, and instead retained the one called slow change, which previously had almost no votes on the Delphi panel and was obviously the least likely to actually be proceeded with and influence the outcome of the models at all. Sound suspicious? Well, that's not the only irregularity that happened around the second Delphi panel. The Net Zero 2050 scenario got a name change. Instead of being called Net Zero 2050, which you'd think might be quite popular after that target explicitly was just adopted, it was changed to being called Progressive Change, which suddenly sounds kind of a little less ambitious. On the other hand, the steady progress scenario, which was eliminated, some of those votes and votes for the now less ambitious sounding progressive change flowed towards what sounded like the most ambitious scenario remaining called step change. Actually, step change wasn't always having such an ambitious name. It used to be called sustainable growth. So through this whole confluence of name changes, basically a panel's idea about what the scenarios were really aiming for would be completely manipulated. And so step change became the clear winner, completely trouncing the influence of the two scenarios that were previously the most likely, the central scenarios, and one of the most popular. Now, the most popular one is not the most popular one, and the other central scenario was just completely eliminated. Sound rigorous? Well, as a result of that, suddenly, step change was by far the most influential. And over the knife edge, billions of dollars of transmission projects got switched into the fast lane. Still sound objective, rigorous, still happy nothing's wrong here, but wait. <laughs> there is still more. The second Delphi panel didn't even have the same experts at it as the first Delphi panel. Even though in the ISP, AEMO says they invited the same panel back. Actually, the panel composition was entirely changed. In fact, it was changed from 10 people to 20 people on the panel, almost entirely new. And consumers were underrepresented, only being two of the 20, 10% for consumers. Of course, the consumer panel said they could have helped to get some more consumer representatives on board if only they were told about it, but they weren't informed this panel was going to occur either. And unlike the first Delphi panel, where there was an explicit process for making sure the weights could be critically reviewed and take written submissions to see whether they made sense and hear everyone's views and opinions, there was no public consultation or written submissions received about the second Delphi panel. Now this is just the most outrageous, contrived, explicit breach of every rigor and protocol there should have been, including the official protocols in the ISP methodology. And I only know about this because the consumer panel still did find out and wrote about it in one of their reports, pretty clearly complaining. Somehow no one in the Australian media picked this up. So there you have it. Call me a crazy conspiracy theorist, whatever, but just please go and read this consumer panel report. They are explicit about it. That's where I found out about it. I'm not the only person talking about this. At this crucial second Delphi panel, the one experiment that might have shown how much cheaper it would be for us to not hit our net zero targets and keep using some coal and gas was completely eliminated from the record. And at the same time, several billion dollars worth of transmission projects flipped just over that knife edge where they were previously hanging in the balance and now became things that the consumers would start to have to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to put into the fast lane. So wrapping up, I just want to be clear, I'm not trying to advocate here for fossil fuels. I would like to decarbonize the economy too. I would like to see though that nuclear is given a fair shot and it's so often just derided as being so incredibly expensive. And you know what? There have been some really expensive projects recently, particularly in the West, partly because Whenever something goes wrong in nuclear, often the whole project gets, gets stopped while the correction gets made and everything gets checked and worked over by the experts again and the regulators and we make sure it's perfect before we go on any further. But in a renewables build out, it seems like the opposite happens. The project isn't all in one place. It's not concentrated under one banner or one organization. It's spread out over every possible different layer of government right across the countryside. Some of it's private, some of it's public, some of it's regulated and halfway in between. And when one bit doesn't add up, one bit doesn't make sense, when one bit doesn't help, instead of stopping and checking to make sure the whole system makes sense and the prices are still right, the opposite happens. We rush things through faster. The procedures and the checks get skipped. Things are hurried along even further. And remember, I think it's worth pointing out that when people are caught out in a big nuclear project, hiding and burying the costs, 
concealing that things have gone so badly they probably shouldn't go ahead. In those cases, we send those guys to jail. But in Australia, for a renewables build out, gee, I don't think anyone even has the decency left to resign. And now we have AEMO, when given a perfectly well-founded factual critique in a national broadsheet, and they can just lie to respond to that. Imagine that, they can just simply lie to cover it up. I mean, how bad is it when some executive that's made a mistake or inept or they're captive to some narrative or they're totally corrupt, they can just write back to a factual critique and lie. And not only they just write back and lie and get away with it, but actually that they get their hand held up by perhaps one of the richest, most influential backers of renewables in the country for a round of applause on social media. And not just that, but then our energy minister picks up that lie and uses it to bash the critique in every single broadsheet newspaper. When lies, when dishonesties, when they're not punished, when we actually celebrate them and hold them up like that, what hope do we have for our system? But I wanna have hope for our system. And to that end, I do have a few specific messages. The first, Simon, I really wanna believe you are a good faith actor. It seems clear to me that you wouldn't engage in this the way you do unless you genuinely thought what you're doing was right. And I hope one day we can sit down over a beer and maybe as friendly rivals just chat about the energy system and how to get the best possible outcome. But before that happens, I have to address the elephant in the room. Your voice for a long time has been the loudest singing the praises of AEMO and the ISP. And now that I've dug deep enough, and thank you for encouraging me to do so, I can now say hand on heart that I don't think the modeling that has been done is really that competent. Given that, let's generously assume that it is in no way contrived and the fact that it ended up hanging on a knife edge between the two most contrasting different development plans, between rushing all the actionable projects and none of them. Let's assume that all of that was purely coincidentally resting on a knife edge and in no way contrived. We still know that at the second Delphi panel, AEMO brushed aside every procedure and rigor to protect consumers. And the net result of that second Delphi panel was that billions of dollars of money was rushed into the fast track, into the actionable projects at the direct expense of consumers and the direct benefit of existing and future investors in solar and wind. So I hope that your voice is now the loudest, calling for an extremely rigorous inquiry into what happened on that day. Because it looks to an outsider like AEMO's process there was either captive to or corrupted by some special interest group. And I hope that you were nowhere near any of that. But also, I kind of think that you owe Claire an apology. Calling someone's work a hot mess, that kind of insinuation they're not emotionally capable of dealing intelligently with the facts, that's pretty low, and I think you're above that. But more importantly, I actually think that Claire was extremely generous in trying to say that the ISP did not properly test whether coal and gas were cheaper or more expensive than renewables. Because if we assume that AEMO was trying to conduct an objective, proper, credible, rigorous test to prove whether coal and gas was actually more expensive than renewables, then I do not know how we would rebuild AEMO's reputation when what they actually did in fact was so consistently and egregiously biased in favor of renewables turning out to be the best answer at every step of the process, leading right up to and including the elimination of the steady progress scenario at that same Delphi 2 panel. And for everyone else, including especially all those people that are fans of renewable energy, wind and solar, I wanna part with an olive branch. Let's just do this analysis properly. Let's do it on an even playing field. Let's do it fairly and transparently. Um, because truth is, like whilst I can't see renewables being the cheapest, best way of doing the transition, I think that nuclear, when you add everything up, is gonna be way better and cheaper, but, if that's not the case, if at the end of the day, when things are properly, transparently, and truly added up, renewables is the best path, it is the cheapest way for us to decarbonize, I don't want that to fail either. And I think that if you get there by hiding costs, not adding everything up, that will hurt your cause too. You won't be able to get the finance, the investment will dry up if you have a business case that rests on all these stupid hidden and sunk costs. Or, and far worse, if you keep hiding and lying and gaslighting when people start asking questions about this kind of stuff, you're just gonna burn all the political capital you have. You'll lose the social license to do anything at all to improve the climate and reduce our carbon output. 
And I don't want that to happen either. So please, let's just do the analysis right. Do it transparently, do it honestly. And forgive me for going on about it, but the ISP and GenCost have definitely not done that. That's all I've got. Please share this video if you think it's important. Please also like and subscribe. Thanks.